So welcome to um, Persistent Identifier Using Archival Resources case to keep it all together, all the Texas uh, 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 to get uh, to, uh, to all the together at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Ming Yu Chen. I use she, her pronouns. I am the head of Metadata Services at the University of Texas at Dallas, a member of the uh, TCDL Planning Committee. I'm pleased to be your session moderator today. Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everybody that is uh, free from all forms of uh, um, harassment and inclusion of all people. We ask that everybody here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt to collaboration before conflict, refrain from the demeaning, uh, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and the speech, and be uh, uh, mindful of your environment and of your fellow and uh, participants. You can also build your code of conduct on uh, uh, TDL org. I'm going to copy the link into the chat box. This session will run until approximately um, uh, until 3 p.m. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. I invite you to see hello in chat. Let us know where you are drawing from, share resources, and make comments throughout today's session. You are also encouraged to post your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be uh, watching your questions to share them uh, with your speakers during the QA session at the end. Now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Juliana Barrera Gomez, um, Emily Johnson, and uh, Kristen Law. I will hand the things over to you now to get started. Great, thank you. So I will go ahead and get us started. Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Emily Johnson and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm the scholarly communication librarian at UTSA. Um, these, my co-presenters will introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, in addition to helping UTSA students, faculty, and staff with copyright and publishing services, I'm one of the administrators for our institutional repository, the Renner Research Press. Uh, so we're really pleased to tell you today about the work that we've done at UTSA libraries to develop policies for access and preservation for digital collections and our DSpace and content DM platforms. <clears throat> uh, so I'll start off by giving you some background on what led us to develop these policies. Uh, so I joined UTSA in 2019, uh, where there was already a project underway to develop an institutional repository uh, hosted by, D uh, by TDL. Um, we were delayed by the pandemic, but we did successfully launch the Runner Research Press as we branded it uh, to the UTSA community in 2020 and early 2021. This is our adorable Roadrunner with Glasses logo that we love, that I like to share. <laughs> um, but of course, the question became, what in the world do we put in the repository and how do we go about getting it? So we already had a few campus partners um, with UTSA hosted journals and other content to get us started, but we began working with our subject librarians uh, to do broader outreach to the UTSA community to gather content. And so we realized we had a unique opportunity to sort of do everything right from the beginning uh, to build repository policies and content from scratch uh, with the benefit of being able to learn from other institutions who have been doing this much longer than we have. So our repository group went about writing policies and procedures for the Runner Research Press. Uh, we began by reviewing the collections and policies of other TDL and peer institutions. Uh, we relied heavily on the experience of our subject librarians who were able to tell us what their campus partners might need out of a repository 
And we also reviewed the existing digital collections at UTSA and their policies. Um, Juliana and Kristen will give you more information on this later. Um, but we reviewed our, our digital collections and content DM, and then we also will talk about our web archives program. Um, so at this, at this time in 2020, when we were doing all this work, there wasn't an overarching group at the library that brought together all of us that were working on digital collections or projects. Um, so we were kind of relying on just one on one outreach to our special collections staff and reading the information they had available on their documentation. And so this is kind of when we first realized that there was the potential for crossover between these digital collections. <clears throat> So what resulted um, was our runner research press collection policy, which I've linked here if you'd like to read it. Um, this, of course, outlines what we will and will not accept in the repository. Um, the shorthand that we use is that basically we collect the, the quote unquote, uh, creative and scholarly works produced at UTSA. Um, that's obviously a very broad collecting policy. Um, so we were immediately kind of worried that we'd end up duplicating efforts or accidentally like poaching a collection from someone that might have actually been better served um, being in content DM. So we realized that we needed to establish clear procedures and communication between the repository team um, and special collections who, of course, manage content DM. Um, so this is a screenshot of our policy is, again, you can read it on the website. Um, but so with that kind of background, I will hand it over to Kristen to tell us more about how we went about developing the policies. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm Kristen Law, and for the past two years, I've been the digital asset manager here at UTSA. And prior to that, I was the, for five years, I was the university archivist here, uh, which is part of special collections. And so it was my experience in that role that was most relevant to this project that we're talking about here uh, with our new repository. So as we were starting to talk about uh, policies and really the question of like kind of what's the border between university archives and our new DSpace instance, um, I kind of realized for myself that I needed to be talking about real world examples and just concrete types of documents and not just hypothetical policy scenarios. That's just how my brain works. I need something real to, to chew on. Um, so I went looking to see what kind of other institutions had done about this uh, potential for overlap with university archives. And I found this really great um, uh, article, excuse me, uh, called Institutional Repositories and the Institutional Repository college and university archives and special collections in an era of change. And even though the article's like 15 years old, I still found it to be really useful. Um, one of the things that was most useful to us at UTSA was that they had a really long list of different kinds of documents that could exist at a university. And so it was all sorts of stuff that I'd seen as the university archivist, but then other things that kind of fell under like the scholarly communication umbrella that I was less familiar with. But um, what we did was by that point, we had a subgroup of about six people who were talking about writing these policies and how kind of the two um, different kinds of institutional rep repositories, if you really think about it, that an institutional repository like a D space versus an institutional repository like a university archives. Um, but how those two programs could responsibly and intentionally kind of share a border and what did that look like so we had a subgroup um, who met um, periodically and while we're working on this project i think we met weekly for a little while i feel like our team was really well suited to talk about this because of our prior experience so um, myself i'd been the university archivist for five years at up to that point and then Juliana who's going to speak in a moment she had been university archivist in her previous role uh, we had Emily as the scholarly communications librarian and so her perspective as the dspace manager um, our like director of special collections used to be the repository librarian at a different institution so that was great perspective we had a subject specialist with a big uh, tech background which was always helpful um, 
And then the last person we had was a new archivist on our team who came to us with a lot of records management experience. And so he had a, a really good perspective on that as well. So anyways, in meeting over the course of a few weeks, we talked about each document type on uh, our list that we kind of pulled from that article. And we talked through all the issues, like was it something appropriate for the IR? Did it make more sense to go in the archives? What access platform did we think uh, users were expecting to find that kind of content? Did it make sense for DSpace? Did it make more sense for Content DM? Uh, was it something that instead would be picked up in our internet archive, um, archive websites program? And then throughout all of that, how did digital preservation play into any of this? Like, and what level of commitment were we comfortable with for like, depending on the type of content? And so uh, we had some really good discussions that was really based on things that we had already seen here at UTSA and, and maybe other places too, but it was nice to be able to talk through these document types, um, to be able to have specific examples of, oh, hey, remember those oral histories from professor so-and-so and um and then yeah our list of documents had uh dissertations and college and alumni magazines uh different kinds of interview recordings uh faculty senate meeting minutes like what happens to those um all kinds of that all kinds of stuff and so as we worked through each type that's really how we built out the policy and as we were talking about the criteria for what goes where that's that's really what built it for us um and so as we we broadly defined the content that we'd selected for the DSpace, as Emily said, UTSA's scholarly output and academic work, while thinking of the university archives and what goes in content DM as the kind of content that is primarily historical collections or primary sources and visual collections work maybe a little better in content DM. Um, and then as I mentioned, we have the web archives program through the internet archive as well. So really, we we're just talking about what does this mean in practice. Uh, so the last thing then that I wanted to mention is that as a, as a last step that kind of came in with that new archivist Barrett with his strong records management background, is he thought it would be important for us to tie uh, document types from this um, guideline policy to connect that over to the records retention schedule that the university has that's already been approved and is like an official document from the legal department and approved by the Texas State Library and Archives. And I thought that was a really good thing that we did because that kind of maybe strengthened the foundation and sort of added some legitimacy to the Runner Research Press as this like new thing happening on campus, this new initiative that had sprung up in like 2019, 2020. So I'm gonna hand things over to Juliana and she'll tell us a lot about uh, preservation. Hi, everybody. I'm Juliana. Um, and whenever I started with this project, um, I was digital archivist uh, here at UTSA for um, several years. And prior to that, I was university archivist for about a year before Kristen came on board. Um, uh, and now I'm overseeing this new initiative that we have on uh, digital preservation and stewardship. So I will talk about um, this group that we formed about the same time that we got the repository. Um, we decided that we really needed to make sure that we had some clear policies on, you know, where things were going to go and what the, the preservation tab was going to be on it. So at UTSA, we formed uh, the Digital Stewardship Governance Group, we call it DSGG for short, um, in early 2001, and our goal was to bring together experts across the libraries who create or work with digital content creators so that we could understand what we have and what we're ultimately responsible for stewarding. Um, and luckily, Emily and Kristen are part of that uh, expert group. Um, this group created an inventory of digital assets across the libraries and elsewhere at UTSA so that we would know what we have. Um, and we meet regularly to discuss common document types and test cases as they arise. Uh, we discussed and made decisions about what discovery platforms would work best for our common document types uh, based on our knowledge of our users and their needs. Like Kristen was saying, you know, the um, knowing that the visuals are probably going to work a lot better with uh, the nice viewer that we have in content DM for things like maps and photographs, but, uh, you know, professors who are wanting to have a strong uh, presence in something like Google Scholar uh, for their reports or for their papers, uh, they're going to be used to and prefer DSpace. Um, 
So we all work together and we discuss preservation needs and how we could communicate our commitment to stakeholders and users. That was another really important uh, point that we wanted to tackle. So next slide. Thanks, Emily. Um, so then coordinating our university archives workflow, uh, we had a subgroup of that larger uh, group that Kristen referred to. Um, and that's where we really started to evaluate what content is part of university archives um, so that we could ensure that we had methods for getting this into our archives. You know, now that users can submit assets and metadata directly to the repository. Um, this is something that's been great. Um, Emily can attest that, you know, people can submit their work. Uh, it's it's all of you who have DSpace know that, uh, you know, this is it's a great way to pull content in. But then how do we get that content ported over to uh, special collections who are the stewards of university archives and make sure that we're uh, checking off all the boxes for the archives um, in just workflow. So uh, we had to think about how we'd actually export the content. Um, we'd have to think about how to get the assets, the metadata, and another tricky one that we had to think of was uh, how we'd be able to use the license agreement that users check off to acknowledge whenever they're uploading to the repository um, to work as a kind of donor agreement for things being transferred to university archives. Um, and then finally, we were scheduling, uh, we will be scheduling reviews of this content and we're actually setting up transfers so that they can be accessioned by the department in a timely way that's going to, you know, not put too much of a burden on um, administrators like Emily or um, the archivists and special collections who are uh, maintaining university archives. Um, so our levels of preservation that we talked about, um, we we can't dedicate resources to preserve everything. Um, I hope everyone in this meeting knows that. Um, and we can't preserve everything at the same level. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we all understood, all of us at UTSA who were part of this group, who were out there talking to uh, donors, to content creators, that sort of thing, that we all understood what levels of service we can offer. And then we wanted to make sure that we had ways to communicate this to people who are submitting so that they would understand when I submit this type of document or this file type, what can I expect out of this? So we came up with two levels of preservation that we wanted to uh, share with people. We termed these extra preservation and basic preservation. So extra preservation um, means that, you know, we're committed to long-term access um, via migration, normalization, and doing like an in-depth review of file formats over time so that uh, people can have a reasonable expectation that they're gonna be able to open up the files and still get the contents inside. Uh, a whole bunch of asterisks on all of that, but, um, Basic preservation is really just we're committed to a bit level file copying. Um, you upload it to DSpace, um, you know, as a text file, you're going to expect that um, in 30 years it'll be available as a text file. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, some examples of the document types that uh, that we broke the types of documents that we identified and, and included in these different preservation buckets, if you will. Um, you know, things for extra preservation were closely tied to uh, things that we're responsible for for university archives, things that come from the, the uh, retention plan. So, you know, publications, um, definitely uh, dissertations and, and theses, uh, reports that come from the university, those sorts of things that we really want to make sure we're preserving well. Um, and then our basic preservation, uh, you know, these were things that will be going into the research press. Um, but we aren't too concerned about um, the uniqueness of these. You know, we feel like maybe we'll be able to find these in other places um, or the format doesn't really matter. Um, the, the file type doesn't really matter or it's going to be uploaded to something that we think is pretty basic, uh, such as a, a PDF that isn't like a, we don't identify it as a, a major uh, preservation risk, I guess. Okay, so then our digital collections, um, really just has extra preservation because in our digital collections, which that is content DM for us in special collections, um, you know, all of these materials are archival um, and everything that's been digitized, uh, we're committing long-term access uh, to these. So again, things that are, that are part of the documents that we wanna keep in content DM are heavily visual things like maps, um, oral histories uh, and their transcripts, you know, newspapers, uh, especially photographs and the other sorts of things that you'll see in that list that I won't read out. Um, and then finally, our web archives program, um, which we use Internet Archive uh, to harvest this content. 
and then generate work files. Um, extra preservation is definitely things like um, UTSA websites um, and UTSA sponsored content that uh, we felt is tied to the retention schedule. These are documents from the university posted online, websites from the university that we're responsible for maintaining. Um, but our basic preservation bucket for that is um, we have a number of community collections that uh, we'd like to, uh, we, we've curated, we've uh, captured this content, it's in Internet Archive, um, but that is a little bit lower for us, um, maintaining those, those work files and maintaining a, a highest level of preservation for those. Um, we're just going to have to leave those at basic preservation uh, now, given resources that we have. So uh, our current status um, with all of this is that we've identified collections that uh, we're ready to migrate over to the Runner Research Press. An example of that would be uh, our Center for Archaeological Research Reports. These are state-funded research reports uh, that come from CRM archaeology done uh, here on campus, uh, or done here by uh, this institute here at, at campus. Um, we found these to be a really perfect fit for uh, for the press's scholarly delivery, um, the staff who submit all of these reports, uh, several reports a year, um, they seem very happy with the self-submittal process. Uh, they used to send us um, mail packets full of DVDs um, of, of all of these reports, and they would uh, be pushed into a backlog with special collections. So it's amazing that they can now submit all of these as PDFs with metadata um, and sign off on that license agreement. And it's up, it's there, they can find it. They're happy, we're happy. Um, we're also testing methods for how to periodically review and accession University Archives content that's in the repository. So uh, as we get more familiar with how DSpace works and, uh, you know, what, uh, what workload is put on, say, uh, Emily as the administrator and, um, you know, archivists and special collections and what our timelines are, we'll come up with a, a more tangible timeline for when we're going to be reviewing and pulling content to put into University Archives. Uh, we're still kind of in the testing phase for that. Um, and then you can hit the next slide, Emily. Um, but I, I wanted to say that the preservation and stewardship work that began simultaneously is still ongoing. Um, and we do have some really great news. We created a framework policy that we're hoping to share uh, on our site soon uh, so that we can share this information with people who are interested in preservation with the libraries. Um, and we've set up our preservation storage environment and our workflow that we're feeling much more confident about. We feel like we have places where we can store all of this, uh, all of these digital assets and uh, work with them and get them through our preservation system. Um, and we're keeping our DSGG group um, and our subgroups so that we can periodically meet and discuss new document types and cases as these come up. Um, some current cases that we're discussing that we're not really sure on um, are things like, you know, how would we handle large data sets um, that we could potentially get uh, from uh, people who are um, sharing data in the repository? Um, you know, what is large? What, what is our limit going to be? Uh, how are we going to how are we going to convey that to users? Um, and will we consider things like um, executable software, you know, uh, if that's something that's that's included in someone's dissertation, uh, how will we handle that? How will we preserve that too? Um, and also things like how can we ingest and provide access to videos um, that are part of electronic theses and dissertations? Um, we've run into this with our music departments. There's uh, hours and hours and hours of uh, footage of performances. There's all kinds of copyright issues that Emily uh, is concerned about. Um, and we're kind of at a, a point where we're going to have to really think about how we can um, ingest this, get it preserved, um, but then also how, if and how we'll be able to provide access to it. And I guess uh, I will say now we're open for questions. Um, and here's our contact information uh, if you'd like to talk to any of us directly. And uh, Emily did provide a link to the Access Platform and Preservation Guidelines document too. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Juliana. So uh, thank you for all the presenters. Um, we're going to conduct a Q&A session in the end of all the sessions. So um, uh, thank you for uh, sharing the best practices and all the amazing uh, projects. Uh, now, 
for our next presentation for the session, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mark Phillips. His presentation topic is wrangling uh, serial titles and the place names in the UNT Libraries digital collections. All right, can, um, can we all see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right, so um, thank you all. Um, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about a work that's in progress here at UNT um, and uh, in relation to how we manage titles and place names in our systems. Um, a brief overview, the UNT Libraries Digital Collections includes the Portal of Texas History, the UNT Digital Library, and then the Gateway to Oklahoma History. Um, in total, we have a constantly growing collection, but currently as of today, we are at 3. Point just shy of 3.2 million publicly available items and uh, a little over 3.3 million unique metadata records in our systems that we're managing um, and trying to uh, keep track of. So a, a lot of content, um, but the problems I think uh, discussed in this scale down um, very easily. So a little bit of the background. Um, there are some, some core concepts we have in the the systems that we maintain that we've had for a long time. The, the, the basic building block we have is, is an item. Um, this could be a, so it's the thing that's in the system. So this could be an issue of a newspaper, a photograph, a digitized book, um, a journal issue, a report, a letter, a map, or kind of any of the, the unique items or things. Um, those are all assigned unique identifiers. We use the archival resource key as part of our persistent identification strategy. Um, and that's an example um, there on the screen. And then those arcs become actionable as part of the URL. And then all of the services for that item are based on that URL structure. Um, the next concept is the, uh, the idea of a partner, and this is generally the contributing institution, organization, or person that contributes the content. They, each partner gets a unique code that's assigned in our vocabulary system that has a unique identifier. Um, it then has a uh, URL and services that are in the digital collections based on that code. And you can see an example of the South Plains College Library that I've included there. And um, there's a one-to-one -one relationship where an item is contributed by a single partner. Multiple partners don't share items. And then the third concept is of a collection. And then this is where things kind of get squirrely. Um, it's the grouping mechanism we have. Um, sometimes they are related to physical collections. Sometimes they're related to aggregations around grants. Um, sometimes they may be aggregations of title, like a series title or a serial title. Um, sometimes they may be one serial title. Sometimes they may be many. It, it really just depends. But again, they're assigned unique codes within our vocabulary systems. Um, they get unique identifiers. Um, and then the URLs um, get generated based on those code codes. Um, and then for collections, there's one or more collections per item. So an item can belong to many different collections. And so I, I bring these up because those are the three concepts um, that we maintain within the system that we're spending our time describing and managing. Um, in addition to those, there are things that we want to maintain um, that historically have not really been done in a curated sort of fashion. And the first of those that we're going to talk about today is titles. So within our, our metadata model, um, titles have the ability, so we have the ability to have multiple titles for a record um, or an item. And each of those titles has the ability to be qualified with a type of title. Um, those title roles um, are documented in our controlled vocabulary system. And they are then presented as a set of dropdowns in our editing system, which you can see on the right side. You can choose what kind of title it is, whether it's a series or a serial title or any of the other types. And then those are then represented in this little XML snippet down at the bottom where you see um, the serial title of Caddo Mills News for that um, issue of the Caddo Mills News. 
And this can become more involved. Um, some of the more complicated things are government documents. Um, this is from the text, the technical report archive and image library, where you have one main title followed by several series titles and then several added titles. And again, they're um, represented in the XML up at the top and then the actual record on the left side and then the um, the uh, close up of the title section where some of them are um, kind of hot links into searches so you can get more records related to those and then others do not provide kind of a quick search interaction. So the challenges with this model. Um, one of the things you run into when you digitize a lot of newspapers is that um, generally the newspaper titles are fairly like oftentimes the newspaper titles carry the name of the uh, the location or the community in it, but that's not always the case. So you have examples of the Daily Herald, the one from San Antonio, the Daily Herald, the one from Brownsville, Texas, the Daily Herald, the one from Paris, Texas, the Daily Herald, the one from Weatherford, Texas, um, and these are the these are all presented in a a bit too simplistic of a manner within our system because they're just short strings that are in in the records and so if you decide you want to view all of the daily heralds you're getting all four of those different locations together which is not a desirable feature um, same thing with the, the daily ledger um, ballinger or the daily ledger hempstead um, so and these happen there are quite a number of these in the collection um, we also run into the fact that because these um, titles aren't don't have some sort of control mechanism, it is very easy for um, both series and serial titles to just kind of go wild. Um, so the Gateway to Oklahoma history has 2300 plus titles, unique titles. Um, the UNT Digital Library has 6300 unique titles. And then the portal has 8,600 titles. Um, some of them are things like the 11th Congress or the 13th Congress, um, which are useful within the context of those records. But when you start to aggregate them, they get kind of odd um, at higher levels. So like I said, the challenges are that this model does, it's a little bit too simplistic. It doesn't scale well. It's the organic versus the curated approach. Um, I showed examples where similar uh, same titles are grouped together in ways that are not always clear to the user and can cause some issues. Um, there's no way of showing relationships between titles with our current model, so you have no, no idea if a title is a preceding title or a succeeding title um, or a related title. Um, sometimes to overcome some of this, we have, we've got records that are really packed full of identifiers where that might not be the best approach. We have some record, very few sets of records, but some that have, you know, three, four unique LCCNs, unique OCLCs, because, you know, the idea is a, a wider net is better. Um, and then we have no explicit listing of titles and no list and no links to titles explicitly as well. So desired improvements to this is we want to be able to list our holdings. We want persistent and easy, easy links um, to specific titles. We want to be able to aggregate our titles in a clean way for generating KBART files or OAIPMH or IIIF um, presentation manifests, or even just atom feeds of, of what are new titles in the system. Um, we want to be able to create um, curated title information and have that be have titles that are related to each other show those relationships. Um, we want to have a lightweight process so that we don't have to go and change individual records to show membership uh, within collections whenever possible. Um, we want to try to leverage the existing identifiers that that um, have been generated by uh, like the Library of Congress or OCLC. And then wherever possible, we want to generate um, the same as relationships or exact match relationships with other um, identifiers. So our first step in this, this is a, um, a work in progress as far as, as adding data. So far, we've got 1,503 titles that are in our curated title space. Um, that and on the right side of the screen is a, a, a screenshot of, of those curated title lists. If you look at one of them, our current very kind of beta <laughs> um, interface just really displays that content information back. Um, there's a lot more that we've got planned for this, but I think the key thing for us is now titles for the, the concept of the Abilene Daily Register is a 
at the same level as a collection or a partner within our system. And it has a unique identifier T00027. And then we can start to hang services, build interfaces, and uniquely link to that content. Um, we, may, we have the ability to, to, to talk about types of titles. So we can do newspapers or yearbooks or newsletters or reports. And um, once again, just an example of how those are uh, presented to the user. So titles was one of the things. And then the other thing, um, all of the titles, they, whenever we started with the title um, side of things, we also uh, wanted to take advantage of the fact that we needed place names in the titles models. And so we wanted to start to control our place names. So right now our location, we, Place names we refer to as locations in the, in the um, interface. And so you can browse by location. If you click on a county, it takes you into a live search um, for that specific county already limited with the facets. And then you're able to browse from there. If you go into a record, um, you can see the, um, the content. There may be a, a mapped icon. And when you click down to that, you see the place names that are included. So this has Loving County and Winkler County. And then we try to, um, whenever possible, put you know, indicators on a map of where that is for those that don't you know, always remember where all of the places in Texas are. And so this is, is done, um, the metadata for this is created through our metadata entry system. And we have a kind of a, a type ahead for our place names, which is generated from the existing names within the system and it gives some indication of how frequently they're used. So if we type Loving County, you get the um, instances where Loving is present and then you can make a decision based on, uh, do you want Mentone? Do you want Loving County as a whole? Or is it actually some place else in Texas that you're looking for? This dropdown is then controlled by this data feed from the solar instance, which is basically, these are the unique strings we use and then the count the number of records that have that string present in them. Um, the way that we draw the, um, the points places on the system, on the maps, is that each of these, what we just kind of refer to as our, our UNTL place name strings, um, those get matched exactly. And then if there's a, an exact match, there's a latitude and longitude that can then be drawn on the thing. Um, the problem is that this is a very static file that is not often generated or updated. So it, it kind of loses the ability to match new places as we're adding those. So the challenges, like I said, the current model is a bit too simplistic. It's organic instead of curated. Um, incorrectly formatted place names get into the system really easily. If you make a typo, suddenly that gets propagated and you're able to you know, keep selecting that and you know, you'll get wrong place names. Um, it's hard to identify when place names are not correctly formatted unless you really have a lot of contextual information about that place or those places. Um, again, no links, no ability to aggregate or display other information. So um, we also desired unique identifiers, URLs, um, the ability to describe historic abandoned and ghost towns. We have lots of evidence of, of places through our newspapers, both in Oklahoma and Texas. Um, not all of those places are represented in things like GeoNames or Getty or Wikidata or Wikipedia. And so we needed to be able to have a system that can not only rely on those, but can add additional information. Um, we wanted to be able to verify places and say like, this has been, this is an author, kind of an authorized place. We've, we've done the work to vet this. Um, again, we wanted to use those same as an exact match relationships. And then um, we also wanted to continue to use our string-based place names for records because they're just an easy way to, to index things and work with things. So these are our um, current uh, curated list, uh, curated places, um, uh, the interface we have for that. There's 1,440, 1,410 curated places for the Portal of Texas history. We show that the top 10 most or 250 most frequent here. When you click into one of those, our current kind of stand in placeholder is just an information about the actual lo location. Um, and you can see the unique identifier. Um, and it once again, now it has the same kind of level as a collection, a partner, or um, an item in the system. So we can start to hang services, we can start to build upon these. Um, the admin interface to all of these. Um, in addition, now that we have a, a system that knows kind of what the existing uh, titles are, we can look at the, the 
solar database that we use for indexing all of this and identify things that don't have title records. And so we're able to pull those out, things that weren't able to cleanly load with our batch loader, things that have incorrectly formatted LCCNs, things that don't have LCCNs or OCLC numbers, and or things that have too many and they just get really funky. Um, and then this is specific to the different interfaces. Um, the same goes for the places in the database. We can identify new place names um, that may not be present in the database and quickly add those and then provide place points to those. Um, we can also, uh, this is limited to um, the, each of the interfaces, so you can see what's new in the portal versus the gateway versus the, the, the digital library, and then that allows for easy curation as new items come in. Um, there's kind of the reverse to that where you can say like what are the only what are our only place names in the database but that aren't currently record rep represented in records and these um, can kind of exist from that initial input import that we did since we have over 17,000 place names in the database um, and uh, so something that we can curate but it also allows you as a curator to go through and say I know I'm going to have this place name I want my um, folks who are doing metadata to be able to have this from the drop down from the beginning so that it doesn't have to get in there organically. Um, the title admin is all of this is done with um, kind of the built in Django admin interfaces, which is the, the programming framework that we use. Um, you're able to limit, to sort, to search, and then um, we have ag actions to generate, regenerate the holdings information. Um, title records kind of have the, I don't know, if you haven't looked into how Kind of authority records around titles work it's got most of the standard things you would want it's kind of a rabbit hole that gets crazy really quick um, but it handles kind of the 95th percentile, 95th percentile of content that we get in. Um, this approach doesn't solve the fact that titles can just go crazy. People can stop and start and stop and start titles, and it just gets really hairy. Um, this doesn't fix that. It just it, it handles most of the main use cases that we've run into with um, all of the newspapers and our other publications. Um, we have the concept of holdings, and which is just a, a quick cache of the solar index so that we can do quick lookups for different browse interfaces, and it also gets used in our aggregation. It includes kind of the first and last issues of, of things, um, a histogram of the year, the counts, um, and then kind of a compact holdings list, as well as the overall number of issues and pages that are available for that title. And those are also then specific to the systems because you can have titles that span across multiple systems. The place names are actually managed as part of the titles database, but um, we leverage it in two ways. You're able then again to kind of organize, organize and search through it in a, a pretty standard way, limit and search. Um, the place detail is really based on the geonames notion of hierarchies, and so we have the admin 0, 1, and 2, and then finally the place name. So the, in the context of the United States, it generally works pretty well where you have the you know, United States, Texas, Loving County, Mintone, you know, those, those four levels. Um, it gets, there are admin three and admin four levels within geonames, which we currently don't support, but that's just like this incredibly tiny portion of the world. Um, and so with the idea that we want the strings to get you pretty close, but maybe not as exact. Um, and then you have relationships, you're able to document the geoname ID and the Wikidata ID, as well as providing Latin long when those aren't available or any sort of evidence for that content. Um, and finally, the, the next steps that we have on this, we want, we're, we're, this summer we're moving it kind of from an Easter egg, it exists and we're testing it out into a full public release. Um, we're going to be begin aggregating all of the all of the title records then into our UNT discovery system, which is our blacklight Im implementation on top of our, our main library catalog. So this will be the first digital content that that gets incorporated into that. Um, and we want to start to mix in the title and place identifiers into the actual item records themselves, um, work with collection and partner level titles. And then we also have concepts um, of title groups or title families whenever you have a publishing run of newspapers that are all related but have different 
title records, you want to be able to group those in certain ways for um, more logical access to people that aren't like super, super into the title record authorities. And then also we have a lot of essays and context for these titles and these different groups, and we want to be able to present that and then also engage with um, people who are interested in writing and learning more about these um, different titles. And then finally, to maintain those doc, those title relationships with preceding, succeeding, succeeding, and um, related titles. Um, and with that, that's the end of my slides. Thank you, Mark, for informative presentation. So now we're conducting a Q and A session. So. Um, Please feel free to ask uh, presenters um, questions, or you can type in questions in the chat box, and I can coordinate the questions. Well, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, for Mark, um, that that was a great. Uh, it was great to see kind of the behind the scenes and of the the the, the work that you're doing at on the on the UNT um, portals. I use a lot. I, re I recently have been working a lot with um, the Texas Historical Commission's collections that have recently be, been added of uh, uh, photographs of historic buildings that have been added uh, that they. They have a, an archive of dating back to the 70s, and it's like 80,000 or so photographs that have recently been put up on the portal of Texas history. Um, and the one thing that's amazing about those uh, is that they've, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, almost nearly been geocoded um, to their address. Um, so I was wondering, you were talking about uh, place, um, place locations and, and uh, lat longs um, down to the um, city level. Um, but I, I do notice that there are lots of, especially with, the, with those, those photography collections, um, lat longs at the individual um, building level or address level. Um, so I, I'm wondering, uh, you know, if, if you're considering, uh, I, I mean, really all of the um, coordinates that, all of the coordinate data that, that you're, that you're uh, collecting in the portal, um, it, it seems to me like, um, I, you know, I really want to see a, a map, a browse by map I, on the portal somewhere uh, to see all of this, all of this uh, GIS data really is what it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that as a, a good feature request. I, I agree, maps are fun. Um, so, so I'm specifically talking about uh, kind of places that are represented by by strings and like concepts like like the city of Denton right if you if you put a place pointer for the city of Denton it just gets kind of weird because like the place point is down to i think like inches level of specificity and and Denton is this huge weird thing <laughs> um, and so you you basically so you want to describe like a concept as opposed to an actual place point um, in addition, because we have the qualifiers, one of the qualifier types for coverage is a place name, which is what we're talking about here. We also have a type which is place points or place bounding boxes, which is that's where we're actually um, including that uh, box information or that place point. Um, we have 181,000 items with geocoded place points, and we have 68,000 that have boxes. Um, identified out of those 300, 3 million. So we've got a lot that aren't, but um, we have place names in all in like 200 or 2 million, 2.8 million records have place names in them of some sort, whether those be, you know, high level Texas or down to a county level, because we don't know place like it's about the whole county of Loving County. You don't have a specific geocode. However, whenever you want to do certain kinds of work, you, you want to at least say like, out of the whole state, like this is where this could be. So you do want to geocode that because you do want to put things on maps. But um, but yeah, I think an overall um, uh, map with geocoded information would be great. And I think this is one of the steps we have um, kind of going down that road that can help. Great. Any 
can now draw questions. So, so I have a question for the, the folks from UTSA. Um, I, I think the uh, the work that you're doing on the policies is is really great. Um, and I was wondering if you plan to kind of share how you got to that kind of the process, because I think that's one of the stumbling blocks for many of us in, in our institutions is like, like, how do you actually get to the point where you're writing a policy? Who are you basing yours off of? Um, which ones are really good? Which ones might not be so good? Um, that are, you, will you be sharing that kind of information more directly? Um, well, I can tell you for sure, for at least the front of research press, um, it was like our, our policies and our like license agreement was very heavily borrowed from UT Austin with their permission. And by heavily borrowed, I mean almost identical in a lot of ways. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that helps, but uh, I mean, definitely, I, like the process was more of just like the group kind of got together and like talked about it. And then we like drafted a document, I don't know. Uh, did that, does that kind of answer your question, at least for the repository, but. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think I'll jump in and say that um, for some of the other policies that are related to that about preservation and how to get things uh, that are university archives. Um, I love TDL and uh, I would join things like um, Dipsug and you know some of the digital preservation uh, events and stuff. And I would talk to other people and hear about what they were doing. And I'd reach out to them and ask them like, you know, how did you do this? Because I, I could sometimes find their policies online, but it was really great to be able to talk to people directly and hear more about the uh, just details about, you know, how many people do you have working on this? Uh, how onerous is it to contact the administrator twice a year to find out you know, how you can review the contents um, to get some actual use cases that way. And I will give a special shout out to Sean Buckner from AM. Uh, he spent like two hours on a Zoom call with me once going through some examples of uh, all of their stuff related to preservation. So you know, um, anyone who's struggling with policies, I would say tap into what you've got with TDL because there are some experts here. They really know what they're doing and they're happy to help. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll second that, Juliana, and I rely really, really heavily on the DSpace user group, the TDL user group that meets once a month, um, as well as on the, the TDL Slack channel, there's like a scholarly communications like interest channel, and I'm constantly just like posing hypothetical questions or specific questions um, to that group, so I definitely rely on their expertise too. Thank you so much for all the answers. And uh, we are running out of time. We uh, will end the sessions right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at other TCDL sessions. Thank you.